So good evening and uh, good afternoon to our friends in other uh, time zones. My name is Ava Yeager and I'm Assistant Curator of Arts Technologies at Serpentine where I work on the Creative AI Lab together with my co-conspirator, Professor Mercedes Bunz, Senior Lecturer in Digital Society at the Department of Digital Humanities, King's College London. The Creative AI Lab is a collaboration between the R&D platform at Serpentine and the Digital Humanities Department at King's. And it follows the premise that uh, collectively, we're really at the early stages of understanding the aesthetics of AI. We're locating new poetics and we're uh, investigating what it means to work with systems that are able to calculate meaning. We're also practicing art making in the so-called black box of machine learning. So the lab holds space for that work and it convenes a diverse conversation like this one that we're having now. And it also compiles a, a database of tools and resource, resources that you can find at creative-ai.org. The lab is also producing knowledge and approaches to digesting and communicating this media through experimental research projects, the evidence of which you can see as my backdrop behind me tonight. Along with our panelists, we're joined by Professor Leif Weatherby, who is co-founder of the NYU Digital Theory HLab, whose work seeks to develop a conceptual framework for understanding and transforming the way we live in and with the digital. As you listen, please feel free to drop thoughts and questions into the Q&A chat, and we will do our best to pick up on them, although we may not get to all of them. Finally, there's closed captions are available uh, during this conversation. To view them, click on the bottom of your Zoom screen on a button that says CC. Uh, BSL interpretation is also streaming. So thank you so much for being here tonight and um, I'll pass it over to you, Mercedes and Leif. Yeah, Leif, do you wanna go first? Yes, sure. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you so much, Eva. That was a wonderful uh, introduction. And I just wanna say first that I've not chosen this pastoral setting uh, here, but instead I'm in the middle of a power outage. <laughs> and so uh, I may turn my camera off at some point to deal with the glare of the sunlight outside. And if I do come back on, you may see the interior of my car because it's my only power source at the moment. So it could not be a less artificially or otherwise intelligent organization out here. Um, but in any case, I'm delighted to be here. I'm so happy to be part of this event. I'm so happy that our lab is collaborating with your lab, Mercedes and Eva. And I just wanna say uh, the Digital Theory Lab at NYU is uh, we're in our third year of existence um, studying digital technologies as meaning-making uh, 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 entities, as cultural entities, and um, focusing very intensely on deep learning as we have for the past few years, um, which brought us to London. And that was the beginning of our, our uh, uh, um, collaboration with, uh, with, with you, Mercedes, and with the lab there, um, all of which is very exciting. I'm so excited to be a part of this panel today. I don't think we could have any, possibly put together a, a stronger set of, of people to talk about this. And I, uh, I uh, just wanted to contribute uh, at the beginning, just uh, a, a simple thought from the perspective that comes from the lab, or uh, which, which is that um, having worked through these materials and thinking about this now, the question of what it is that, what role aesthetics plays, what role art really plays in the development of these technologies themselves. And we see at least two, I think, um, major roles, non, some often overlapping and uh, certainly not an exhaustive list, but one of them is critical. And we've seen that, for example, last year in Trevor Paglin and Kate Crawford's experiments with ImageNet, the revelations of, of bias, the ongoing revelations of bias, that that was achieved through a kind of uh, playful or aesthetic uh, 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 experimentation with these systems. And then the other one, which I think uh, uh, we're seeing, we're seeing uh, proliferate now, is one that I would call exploratory, probative, um, um, 
uh, it, deeply experimental. Um, and I'm thinking, for example, of Refik Anadol's work, Machine Hallucination, in which he took the individual layers within a deep learning system and sort of played them out cinematically on the inside of a black box in, well, I saw it in Manhattan in any case, um, and named those layers latent cinema. And this was a, a sort of uh, uh, a major uh, con contribution to thinking about what the aesthetics of the interior of the black box is. So it's not really a black box as we know, it's at least gray. And when you open that up, you start to see things that have either aesthetic value or critical value or both. And the thought that was guiding me into this as, as I went through the reader and as we were you know, thinking about this event was, how far is it really from that kind of critical but exploratory practice to the kind of work that Chris Ola does in Towards Data Science with these sort of trippy visualizations of what's going on inside the machine, those kind of neon dog pieces that you see or those like, uh, of course, always cats, you know, that you see sort of made into these rainbow colors and, and so forth and so on. So I just wanted to frame that around this kind of not just the critique, which was very strong and very necessary and very important, but also this genuinely exploratory capacity of aesthetics here to deal with a situation in which we have so much data that it isn't clear from the beginning if we'll be able to make sense of it at all. So I just wanted to frame it around that and then hand it over to you, Mercedes, to, to jump into the conversation. Right, um, I'll take it from there. So um, yeah, um, just uh, at the beginning, this discussion is part of a project that Eva and me are running with a creative AI lab that is um, sponsored by the AHRC, um, which is called Creative AI, Machine Learning as a Medium in Artistic and Curatorial Practice. And we will see some examples later on of this practice. Um, so it's based on our belief that, um, yeah, the belief is backed up by observations <laughs> that artists curators and art critics have started to explore the creative and aesthetic capacity of machine learning. And I can now just um, confirm what Leif just said. I think we believe, and the discussion today will be a test of that. There are two strands at the moment in um, machine learning art, and one strand is critical and the other is creative. So um, we think we need to reflect on the societal impact of this technology critically, but also on its creative capacity. And we believe that art is offering a space for the creative and playful exploration of this technology, and also for ethical and societal critique and reflection. So today in this discussion on machine learning and its aesthetic capacity, we seek to answer two questions, which we will ask the panelists. What new aspects does the technical framework of machine learning bring to art making? And conversely, what can artworks that use AI point to in AI research and development? So I'll um, now introduce my guests and I'm quite excited to have them all here. Uh, I'll start when, and we're all coming from different parts of the world. So um, I start with Nora Khan. Nora, you sit in Providence, I believe at the moment. So Nora is an author and critic who writes on emerging issues within digital visual culture, experimental art and music practices, and has contributed substantially pieces to the philosophy of emerging technology. She's a professor in digital and media at Rhode Island School of Design. Um, she was the editor of Rhizom, one of the oldest and most important initiatives for commenting and preserving digital art. My next panelist I'd like to uh, introduce is Murat Khan, who is, to my knowledge, not related to Nora, and also <laughs> sits uh, in Britain and uh, not in the US. Um, Murat is a PhD student at University College London and a visiting petitioner at Central St. Martins. His research explores philosophies of noise and individuation through the operations of compression, distortion, and error in computational systems. His last text is a fascinating collaboration with Ramon Amaro, published in EFLUX titled Towards Black Individuation and a Calculus of Variations, in which they make the philosopher of technology, Gilbert Simondon, meet up with post-colonialist thinkers Franz Pannen and Sylvia Winter, 
to explore the possibilities for black individuation and invention. Now, if this sounds all very complicated, I ensure you if Mura talks, it is much easier to follow than if I read it out to you. Murad is an expert in facial recognition, both from a practical as well as from a theoretical perspective, and has contributed to various workshops and art pieces using machine learning to explore the logic of adversarial and epistemic models and how they exploit statistical learning systems. Welcome, Murad. And last but not least at all is Joanna Sidinska, who also is based in London or Wimbledon. <laughs> Joanna is a professor of new media and communications at Goldsmith University of London, media theorist and a visual artist. She has held visiting positions as guest professor at Shandong University in China, Winton Chair Visiting Scholar at the University of Minnesota, and was Beaverbrook Visiting Scholar at McGill University in Canada. She is currently researching perception and cognition as boundary zones between human and machine intelligence. And her last book, of which you, if you downloaded the reader, could uh, read one chapter is AI Art, Machine Visions and Warp Dreams. Joanna, um, I'd like to start um, with you the discussion and your book, AI and Art, Machine Vision and Warp fully provocatively in the title, Can Computers Be Created? A Misguided Question. Now, um, I know your work a little, and I know this leads from your post-human work on non-human photography. So I'm quite curious maybe, first of all, to learn a little bit more about how the book came about and how you see the relation between AI and art. Um. Okay, thank you, Mercedes, and thank you for having me here and being in such wonderful company. Um, so that question, that provocation, can computers be creative, um, is quite reductive, I, I suggest, in the book, because it's premised on a pre-technological idea of the human as a self-contained subject of decision and action. But also the notion of the computer, this computer we are comparing with that human, be it in the shape of a data processing machine, a robot or an algorithm, is only seen here as an imperfect approximation of such a human. So basically the question is, is it good enough? So rather than ask whether the computer you know, can be creative, we should be asking after philosophers such as Willem Flusser and others, whether the human can actually be creative or more precisely, what does it mean for the human to be creative? And to speak about this, I wanted to kind of show a few illustrations uh, of what I mean by this, while also suggesting that maybe we could ask better questions about AI art going beyond that, you know, are they creative yet? You know, can they be one day and who is the they? In all this. So with the first slide here, you've got um, an image, sorry, it looks a bit blurry, but here we go, um, from the 2016 project by Microsoft called The Next Rembrandt. And it involved the scanning of many paintings uh, by Rembrandt in 3D. So you get, you got the texture, you got the technology, and producing a new Rembrandt, obviously in quotation marks. Um, and that, um, that image, and it was printed with special oils, and it's based on data analysis of kind of Rembrandtian style, if you like. And it's a kind of work which got a lot of publicity for Microsoft and also for machine learning, uh, as well as for a kind of sophisticated printing technology, which could print paintings suddenly. And I found this interesting, but also kind of disappointing in the sense that as that this was the kind of project that got a lot of attention and it focused precisely on this idea of computers being almost as good as humans, being able to give us more Rembrandts, which of course is not the case because what when we're talking about the Rembrandt, we're not just talking about the inherent beauty of the paintings, we're also talking about the whole kind of cultural value, uniqueness, the capital that's attached to it, all of this. But what we what happened with this particular Rembrandt was the, the kind of style transfer 
as it's known, of a particular artist, great master, well, Rembrandt in this case, and you know, great masters are, it's not an unproblematic concept as we know, and producing basically more of the same. So as a, as a PR kind of shtick, that was quite successful. The painting itself, depending on your you know, aesthetic uh, preferences, you might find it beautiful, you might find the whole thing terribly kitsch, but the debate around it and the possibilities were both an opening and too quick a closure for me in the sense that um, they created the possibility of um, putting on the table the, the opportunities of AI art uh, as a certain form of PR campaign and opening and closing things too quickly, uh, limiting aesthetics to what's already been, to something we already know. And we could say that a lot of AI art these days, and I'm saying this as someone who's got great fascination with AI, and with while also critically interrogating in that other vein of this panel and your, your larger project, the kind of beliefs, the assumptions that shaped the debate about artificial intelligence and whether it is actually an intelligence and you know is you know, what is human intelligence so kind of dealing with these issues to ask questions whether we could perhaps do better than just enact either a form of style transfer the kind of works that um, repeat what we already know or if we could have the next slide please or that create these kinds of slightly uh, surreal slightly fascinating work uh, produced by kind of generative networks um, that dream up images of humans, of objects that we find slightly uncanny, slightly um, disturbing, and yet to some extent that they also repeat a certain form of visuality that we're already familiar with and then shifting it a little bit. So in the book, and I'm going to show you the book here, I'm not selling it, the book is free, it's freely available to download. So but in the book, I'm trying to kind of run with this idea of uh, AI art as we know it at the moment as a form of candy crush. Uh, something that's extremely seductive, and I have to admit that myself and my visual practice, I've been playing with uh, these um, generative networks and with the possibilities they open up. I have to admit, in a perhaps narcissistic way, I've been seduced by my own productions, or rather the co-production with those networks, and there was the bodily movement they encourage uh, when they get animated, something that happens in the process. But also I've been horrified by my own fascination with some of these images and seeing how they they get picked up at a lot of festivals, they get uh, written about as the kind of new stage in imagination. And I was wondering, is, the, is, that, you know, is that enough? Do we want something else? Or is there something disabling in this form of hallucinatory production that mimes us into some kind of form of, uh, uh, of bodily fascination with the, with the kind of production of particular forms of visuality without probing deeper, without going somewhere else. So maybe as part of that, I've started asking, so rather than art that becomes a form of PR campaign for platform capitalism, basically, and very often it is literally sponsored by kind of big uh, companies that uh, uh, kind of prop up a lot of developments in AI. Uh, I'm wondering, is it possible to think about this artificial intelligence on a philosophical level in a kind of, uh, and to take it somewhere different? And what would it mean to have kind of uh, art that is really artificially different and that enacts, provokes, invites really different forms of intelligence? And if it is so different, would we be able to recognize this form of intelligence? And if you could have a look at the third slide, please. And as well as looking at um, the Serpentine's exhibition of Pierre Hugues and his Umwelt images that explored machine vision and tried to imagine how machines see, whether machines see, whether we can actually describe machines as seeing, I was looking at the, uh, the work of a Estonian artist Katya Novitskova and her pattern of activation in which she creates 
Um, artificial intelligence, and that's my way of describing her, as well as uh, theorist Toke Lickerbergs, uh, who described her work as art for another intelligence. So Novitskova's project feels like a spoof version of these kinds of artificially intelligent work, which mesmerizes and seduces the viewer. But there is no visual seduction as such, as with some of these earlier works, perhaps, but the, instead the visitor goes into a strange archive of mid images, objects, sculptures, installations, and is faced with a set of puzzles. What are these electronic cradles? And there were a few in the exhibition. What are they doing here? The exhibition in Britain was shown at the Whitechapel last year. What's happened to the human babies they were meant to be cradling? And what do these alien-like creatures hovering above them stand for? So her kind of post-internet dystopia, uh, for me, precisely opened up another form of art for another intelligence. Um, and her work offers perhaps a premonition of the world to come, a world in which not only the majority of images are produced by, uh, not, you know, are produced with a machine viewer in mind rather than human, as Trevor Paglen tells us, but also one in which machines constantly perceive, communicate, and exist with other machines. So drawing on non-human databases and modes of perception, she creates a work for an artificial intelligence which is not here yet, inviting a speculation on the future of different species. So we could say that this is art as uh, another intelligence. So just to wrap up my answer then, that question, can computers be creative, is reductive for me because it's premised on a very kind of pre-decided, if you like, and human-based notion of intelligence as well. Well, I'm much more interested in recalibrating and rethinking, using art as well as philosophy, rethinking the notion of intelligence, including human intelligence, as always already non-human, as always already including other forms of intelligence, and that kind of links to my uh, earlier work that you kindly mentioned, Mercedes. And maybe looking at human creativity as already partly computational, we could look at things from the kind of, you know, the, the uh, kind of the DNA setup to uh, technological and cultural algorithms we kind of run on. And to say this is not to uh, pronounce some kind of uh, biological or technological determinism, but to ask a bigger question about, you know, if we do repeat uh, a certain form of, of cultural algorithm, which is also partly technical, because as we know from reading philosophers such as, for example, Simon Don, that you know, is discussed in the reader by yourself, Mercedes, and other writers, uh, or Stiegler or, or Flusser, we know that that relation, that distinction between technology and culture is not so clear cut. So if we accept that, can we think about um, forms of creativity in the human that are also partly technical. And if we do indeed run on algorithms, and you, know, you can just look at people's Instagrams and see how, I mean, most Instagram feeds do look like they've been produced by a machine anyway, and partly they have to some extent. Uh, so if we agree, if we accept that, what forms of creativity can emerge from, the, from within that technical milieu? What forms of intelligence can we actually think of, develop? And this would be the kind of thinking about our AI aesthetics as maybe going beyond what's become this kind of mesmerizing hallucinatory uh, visuality and looking elsewhere and looking at AI aesthetics as something to think with rather than just kind of look at and sense with. Thank you. Um, that was um, super interesting. I particularly love your point uh, that human creativity is already computational. And I was just thinking I, um, of, I know, I mean, on Twitter, we have bots of, if we have bots on Instagram yet, but I'm sure they're about to come. Um, I want to pick up one um, element that you just said, which um, was that a lot of times when we talk about AI, um, there's post-internet dystopia. And with that, I want to lead over to Nora um, before we come back to the discussion, because Nora, in your work, what really fascinates me is that you pick out those really difficult and dark topics like super intelligence or also surveillance, which is your other essay on AI. 
but you manage to find a way in and out that leaves the darkness somewhat behind. And I found this sentence that you said, and I probably lead you away from what you want to share in your contribution, but um, you said, as an art critic, I have long advocated for the artistic, intellectual, critical, and philosophical potential of working with and through the discoveries of AI. And I think that's also a topic I hope that we have today here, that um, from uh, Joanna to you, Nora, to Murat, I think we all are interested in talking with AI and not just about AI. And what I was fascinated particularly in your work is that you described it in the text that is in the reader, also as a rich poetic device. And that was your way um, where you turned uh, the super intelligence. So maybe you can say something about that. Great, thank you, Mercedes. And Joanna, that was a beautiful, beautiful uh, provocation to, I'm a little intimidated to follow up after that, but just thank you for having me here today. Um, yeah, so looking back at that essay from 2015, I mean, that was five years ago in AI terms is many, many, many lifetimes ago. But just some things I, I was reflecting and updating it for this year, um, you know, the prospect of a super intelligence past the range of human cognition or perception is just really, was very productive for me as a writer then. Uh, the core argument, I think I still hold to it, which is that technological experiences that are beyond language or beyond words really help us as writers and as thinkers make metaphorical bridge work to help us think about scale and speed of cognition beyond our conception now. So a super intelligence, even if it's speculative, puts kind of pressure on language and it changes our politics and changes our position in relation to it. But over the last five years, I've been working a lot with artists who are using AI both as a tool and as an equal kind of collaborator. And I've seen for myself the stakes for art criticism really rise over that time where I find art criticism is often unequipped to describe the kind of aesthetics and visual outputs of machines making images or paintings or works of art. And that's just sort of what I wanted to touch on uh, today. I'm thinking about supernatural metaphors that uh, for what is man-made as kind of suggesting a remove where no human intervention is possible. And the metaphors that we use for technology as having like heavy political implications. So behind Eva, we see a black box. A black box is super effective in describing machine learning as it's used by massive companies uh, in conveying the kind of priest-like ownership of technical information, but it also creates a sense of remove that makes us supplicants. Sarah Watson's written about data as an ocean that we can't fathom, that we drown in and that we surf in. I think of the internet cowboy or the frontier of the internet as um, you know, Wendy Chun and Don Chan both argue gives, gives rise to a neocolonial kind of approach to digital space or to the internet as a space to be conquered. So any metaphors, even metaphors for super intelligence can be used in service of the technology itself and come to dominate all the discussion of it and make criticism a real challenge. And so right now I'm kind of reflecting on my work with artists who work with AI for a longer book proje project. And the thesis is kind of, uh, is essentially that critics need more expansive and rich metaphors for technological experiences that move past binaristic frameworks. Um, you know, for the last couple of years, art criticism and, and writing about aesthetics of AI has become a kind of ground zero where we can figure out this language. And so I think we have this, yes, up on screen. Um, this is a scene from Untitled Film Stills by the artist Casey Rios, and who has a recent book called Making Pictures with Generative Adversarial Networks, which I was editing over the past year. And I ended up looking at a lot of these images and trying to find my language for the images that GANs produce and find that often when artists and students of mine are using, uh, you know, runway ML or other machine learning tools, there's often a silence or confusion or a kind of wordlessness in response when asked, what's the significance of this image? So we need a broader glossary specifically around language to describe machine learning art or machine learning aesthetics that's often co-created with others, co-created with the machine. And 
often the response are is a combination of terms like dreamlike or an unconscious speaking or a machine dreaming and public. And this language is just what I wanted to focus on just for a few few minutes to a close. So I sort of see this as the far other end of the distant ASI where a super intelligence is beyond all comprehension. We can just observe it and kind of stunned off. And so when we use words like surreal or dreamlike to describe the output of, again, the machine's dream, a kind of computational surrealism, these portmanteaus suggest an aesthetic that's really related to human art history. So if we call it surrealist, it would be an uncanny defamiliarization of what exactly? Is it from the process of pattern making? Is it defamiliarization from our own visual frameworks? Do we use dreamlike to describe everything from a million images of faces to a million images of a thousand drawn from a thousand films to a data set of a million cars. Um, I find that the term dreamlike often can, it comes out of the overwhelming scale of ML aesthetics. But when we use dreamlike, there's a divorce from a critical reading, I would argue, not because we can't analyze dreams or there isn't theory around what dreams mean, but because the word dreamlike suggests such a divorce from reality, such a mutable and changeable and subjective space that critique is almost rejected or becomes inapplicable. I love to debate this with, with everyone here in a bit. Um, the images, you know, I see the images of produced by again uh, are produced through a set of patterns being recognized, a mathematical process. So it's super important in language to struggle through articulating what these images signify and how the language we do use limits our understanding of the technological process uh, and their aesthetic import importance. So in this case, Rius uses up to 200,000 training images he describes in this book, and often they're drawn from films. And he approaches the GAN very without any preciousness. The GAN is his tool and he shapes and defines and creates the tool. Every output that you see is a product of an aesthetic choice. Um, Rius kind of walks us through how he feeds frames of films and adjusts each, edits them, blurs foregrounds before putting it into the training set. In part because the training pictures that go in need diversity, which makes a gener generator network be coherent. And so the images can be from the latent space of images from a film like Persona by Bergman and for me, suggests another kind of language about the atmosphere of the cinematic world that created the training set of images. And it's the language of how these images we're seeing are new, how they're different is where criticism often tends to falter. But I would just put forth that we do have language in myth and in symbolic language to suggest the mood of an atmosphere or the symbolic world of a Bergman film as it emerges. Um, a Bergman famously used shadow selves in his films. He had a lot of symbols of people on cliffs, like right on the precipice, aspiring like right, right to, the, to the divine. Um, and as a viewer or as someone reading images critically, we have all of the language of interpretation, both in understanding the mathematical process, so we can understand how a Bergman film is symbolically constructed or if they're Bergman-like patterns across his films. But there's also a powerful ambiguity that is where my hopefulness about criticism in this space comes from, which is this ambiguous psychological space that's created between what we're seeing, the GANs images, what it learned, and the original training images. So I just think there are some really interesting linguistic questions here for this space, this psychological space between the original image and this image. So what would the language be for us being able to see the field of all possible images and what's the language for the psychological space we have where we have an image and a machine in the process of learning to identify the original patterns, the patterns of the original images. A machine that's a quarter of the way there, half of the way there, um, you know, almost there. What is seeing along a limit or along an asymptote and how does understanding the seeing of a machine in process help us understand our own relationship to computation and our own relationship to AI as one in progress, a relationship in progress? 
in which we're equals, even if we're not totally cognizant or sure of what's going on. <laughs> so I guess I would just end with saying I the, the more I dig into language, critical language for machine learning art and AI art to try my best to evaluate why it's compelling and why it's interesting. It's the moments that my language fails and I fail that I find the most interesting and keep circling back around. And you know, looking at this video, I feel I could easily spend five more years trying to find language for what we're looking at, but would find that preferable to calling it dreamlike and, and that dreams are meant to be interpreted so we can better understand ourselves. So I guess it should be no different for a machine's dreams. So those are just some notes I had. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I particularly, I mean, you are absolutely right. In the tradition of uh, speaking about artificial intelligence, uh, the uh, ever since Philip K. Dick came up with um, to androids dream about electric sheep, the dream has been one point which we try to find or automatically like a stereotype look out for an artificial intelligence and your suggestion that you know uh, we need to find a much more a language that is more granular to describe um, machine vision and the different aspects it can do instead of just saying oh it's a superpower oh it's much more powerful than my eyes it's it's so yeah that is really so important it's quite interesting to link it back to uh, a task that is on us as humans and not oh because it also helps us to not feel you know uh, lowered and not capable of dealing with things anymore and feel not as good as the machine um yeah so that's a great suggestion thank you um I want to link, I mean, you showed uh, Casey's work and um, I think when we said in the beginning, um, we find critical work and we find playful work with AI, um, Murat and me, when we discussed uh, in preparation this um, discussion, we also thought, found two other things, which is um, aesthetic artworks that focus more um, on the outcome, on the vision, on the visuality and artwork that focuses more on the back end and conceptually open up the back end, which is why we brought you Murat here, really. Um, yeah, ever since I came across uh, your work that you did uh, together with, I um, probably pronounced the name wrong, Shinji Toya in 2019, um, where, yeah, I, I, is, is the title Identity Turns on a Pixel When the World Becomes a Picture? Or yeah. Is it, yeah. That, so it's a really great um, artwork. Correct me if I describe it wrong. It is done in a way. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting a drink in. <laughs> it is done in a way that um, that uh, you understand and which the picture pixel is where uh, an identification of a face as Caucasian or Asian switches. So Murat was able. Uh, and the video on your website explains this really very well, um, how uh, to identify the pixel that turns the identification of um, the artist's face into whether an Asian or a Caucasian, which is really good. And you continue this line of work in your recent thinking and writing about adversarials. And I hope you share this a little bit with us now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, thank you, Nora and Joanna for great presentations as well. And I think what's quite interesting is I'm going to focus on the idea of the adversarial, but not in the same sense of the adversarial as a generative adversarial network, which is kind of inclined towards a productive form of practice. I'm more looking towards a conceptual framework to describe antagonistic aesthetic engagements with machine learning technologies. And these often open them up for subversion or evasion. Um, and a lot of these kind of examples stem from a close engagement at the level of the code, but we can count something like Hito Shale's How Not to Be Seen as a kind of precursor to the adversarial aesthetic, which is indebted to Harun Faraki's concept of an operational image. So in the sense that I think about it, I think, I think in the context of cybersecurity, essentially, where an adversary is attempting to engender points of failure or evade detection from an intelligent learning system. So an adversarial aesthetic then engages with a machine learning system to create error in the learning model and take that error as a starting point for subversion or pushing it towards breakdown. 
And so important to this is the idea or the practice of creating adversarial examples, which is what we've got on screen now. Um, so you can have an image that is traditionally recognized by an algorithm, in this case, as a cat, um, given the training data for the model, but the addition of a comp carefully computed bit of noise can force the model to select another classification in the feature space. So here's change to an ostrich. And these kind of perturbations are imperceptible to the human eye, but cause a fundamental destabilization at the level of the machinic eye. Um, and it renders it almost useless then in achieving its classification goal if its goal is to pick out cats. Um, and this is kind of a trivial example of it, but these kind of practices open up a discussion around, you know, the concept of the black box that we've all mentioned, because it forces these models into a zone of miscooperation. So the adversary in forcing these kind of perturbed images to the machine encourages it to feed back its gradient for its learned space of representations. And so you can begin to build a picture of the system. And so classification functions almost as a type of leaky abstraction. So it leaks those details it's meant to kind of occlude away. And it gives us a chance to interpret or explain what's going on in the network. And so this kind of dynamic between, I guess, the adversarial and the interpretable or the explanatory is kind of a big push in, in discussions of transparency around bias and, and things like that. Um, and you can see this at a kind of everyday level as well, as users feed into kind of social media interfaces, they may begin to form an in interpretation of how their feed is curated or how machine learning models on there may influence their choices and they develop these kind of folk theories of explaining the learning system. Um, and one recent example of this is, uh, people may have seen, is Twitter's thumbnail cropping algorithm was recently seen to provide a preferential crop to lighter skin subjects, and it was unable to properly define darker complexions. And once people started noticing it, they all, everyone started kind of sharing adversarial examples. Um, so they would post images which had been resized, they changed the color spaces, they'd crop them slightly, and they're all looking to see kind of, would my image be detected? Would it be focused on it or not? Um, and these are kind of very low level, but everyday adversarial practices we engage with when we've got a pervasive kind of algorithmic system on our social networks or, you know, the, the infrastructures we interact with. Um, in terms of aesthetic practice, though, you know, this emerges in, in more complicated guises. Um, Adam Harvey's CV Dazzle is one of those things which has become kind of synonymous with facial recognition, I think, recently, um, as well as jewelry designers who are looking to break recognition models by making glasses or other forms of um, facial adornment to stop machines recognizing the fact of a face or what it recognizes as a legible face. Um, and these kind of optical practices are really designed with a knowledge of how machine perception functions, how it organizes understanding of a face as a legible surface and seeks to break it as a kind of counter surveillance strategy. And Adam Harvey, I guess in recent weeks especially has, has noted that his method was intended to demonstrate, I think for the Viola Jones car ha, cascade method of facial recognition. So it was a specific implementation of an algorithm by which you could use this avant-garde hairstyling or makeup to break up the continuity of a face. Um, but what he does provide in doing so is this kind of more abstracted or generalized method, which you know focuses really on that, that underlying question of what is recognized as a face, what constitutes um, the subject in that sense. But we've also seen examples of adversarial audio being developed as a kind of part of a growing engagement with what some people call machine listening um, around the rise of voice recognition technologies or voice digital voice assistants, which are these kind of open ears of surveillance in our own homes. Um, and these are often now being coupled with slightly more um, for surveillance focus metrics, so cough detection or aggression preemption in public spaces, which tries to see if, you know, a, a noise level is rising, if we're, you know, rising to the level of the social disturbance. And they use more and more now to police spaces on the basis of sound um, rather than just what they're seeing. And some security researchers then have experimented with noisy inputs that prevent an Alexa device from responding to their wake word 
uh, or embedding secret messages which force a phone to open up and search certain things or carry out certain actions. And so these are two kinds of adversarial aesthetic then which deal really with the way in which machine learning systems learn, the way in which they construct their set of representations, but also the way in which their models, I guess, can be opened up again um, through experimentations with error and subversion uh, in order to undermine them. And I guess the final form of adversarial aesthetics I want to touch on is slightly more abstract, but it follows on in the same kind of vein. And it broadens out from a suggestion raised by Kalpani Seshradi Crooks in her text, Desiring Whiteness. And this is a text you know, about a Lacanian philosophy of racial seeing based on signification. And she tells us that we must develop a new adversarial aesthetics that will throw racial signification into disarray. Given that racial discourse was produced in a thoroughly visual culture, it's necessary that the visual itself be used against the scopic regime of race. And so she proposes an adversarial aesthetics that destabilizes racial looking so that racial identity is always uncertain and unstable. You know, and in doing so, she highlights a practice concerned with, I guess, the differential visibility of racialized bodies in machine learning algorithms. Not just that, the differential um, visibility of bodies in, for darker skin complexions, which also stratifies across gender expression, but as a kind of transformation of race in the sense that Wendy Chun envisages in race and as technology. Um, it tr the troubling of race as a connective perceptual tissue or organizing optic, the question of how to be seen without being already known. You know, and perhaps you might look to practices like Sandra Perry, for example, who looks in her own words to head into the space of abstraction and to not hold on to ideas of representational visibility that might not be great for us and to find joy amidst the noise or the jumble and stake a positive claim to identity. And Sandra Perry's work, you know, doesn't explicitly use machine learning technology as an adversarial aesthetic, but engages with the computational nature of classification itself and of racialized seeing. So hopefully I've outlined a form of adversarial practice, which isn't so much to do with generating new forms of image, um, but generating, I guess, refusals of the potential of um, a machinic image, the refusal of an image which is already dictated by the machine by its training data and towards the kind of more antagonistic subjectivity. Of course, I'm muted. <laughs> Thank you, Murad. Um, that was uh, very technical and very interesting uh, to see the adversarial perspective and the world that adversarials can bring into understanding artificial intelligence. As someone asked um, the text you just mentioned, maybe you can just share it in the chat. Um, so uh, we have a bit of time for questions. Um, if you want to type, can I remind everyone to type their questions into the chat? Um, I want to ask everyone, and please a very short answer so that we still have time uh, for the questions that uh, are about to come in hopefully very soon. Um, I'm asking you a boring question. Um, I'm very happy that you all spoke because I think we have a really excellent, um, yeah, uh, we have really very three different uh, positions here um, where how to solve the mess we find ourselves in which artificial intelligence in how uh, exciting this mess actually is and you all showed that beautifully and i'm going to ask you a very boring question um, what you recommend um, art institutions to be aware of uh, and what is missing at the moment because you all work with or art institutions or linked to art institutions you teach yourself, um, all three of you. So I'm quite uh, curious as, um, yeah, the framework of this is also art an art institution. What do you see at the moment missing? Uh, I think Nora, you pointed that out quite clearly. Um, but yeah, can you maybe very quick in short answers answer that question? Nora, do you want to start? <laughs> 
Sure. I, I think on the side of curation, when it comes to working with AI art or art that uses algorithms or any of the work in this field, from, from my perspective, art institutions need to help create that space of accessibility and debate for a larger public. So if someone is walking into an exhibition about facial recognition or predictive policing or um, you know, any of the amazing works that people have mentioned today, it is also creating a kind of bridge work for someone who's not involved in the art tech scene or is not versed in the academic language to be able to access the core concepts and themes. Mm -hmm. And so if one doesn't know what an algorithm is, there is a way to show the logic of it or to make yeah. a visitor feel it and understand it. And so yeah. I think curators and in art institutions play like a critical role in forming, forming that space. Yeah, I think that's a good point, which people underestimate that you can understand the operational logic without actually knowing how to program. Murad, what would be your answer to my question? Yeah, I mean, I think I absolutely agree with you is that especially understanding that the operational logics aren't singular to computation, you know, and is really emphasizing the long history within the humanities and the arts, which engages with all of the same problematics and the same kind of critiques we're dealing with, the problem of mimesis or, you know, kind of reproduction of representation or, you know, categorization and classification, which are huge themes. Um, so I think I'd really have to echo what you and Nora have said, but it's it's really not thinking of it as something so new that, you know, perhaps to be scared of kind of going into it. And as Nora suggested, you know, feeling that you can't find a language to express it in because we've worked for many years on on similar languages and similar themes. So I think it's just pushing them closer together and not seeing one as just the domain of the statistical or the mathematical um, and really about, you know, visibility. Thank you. And Joanna? Um, it's just something of building on what I think Nora and Murad and yourself have said, uh, this would be this idea of maybe going beyond the hype and the candy crash and this idea of the metaphor that I think the both the other two speakers really powerfully talked about and institutions such as you know art galleries museums but also connected with educational settings they not only are they equipped with a critical discourse although of course the affordances of critical discourse in a gallery setting would be different to those in the university they don't have to be identical they have to in a way it's great if they open up to different modes of communicating sensing creating environments but that sense of for example if you take these generative adversarial networks i mean who is the adversary here the who is the enemy and that kind of question so it's almost starting with very simple questions about very complex subjects and bringing in both the knowledge of art history that you know galleries museums uh, have constituted and have with them and also can train people in through kind of putting them in those spaces but also knowledge of other disciplines from arts and humanities which is a discipline of asking questions and the questions that are you know the questions of technology don't always have to be technical there are a number of other questions and even though a basic understanding of technology often is needed to grasp the significance of some works or their pointlessness as the case may be but there are other sorts of questions and other discourses and that people shouldn't be afraid to ask even if they are not trained in ai computer science mm -hmm. thank you leaf i think you have a question or contribution right yeah thank you so much mercedes and i just want to say thank you to everyone on the panel for these wonderful talks I mean, I'm, I'm learning a lot and I'm just, it's its uh, super thought provoking. Um, as promised, I shifted to the car to keep the phone battery alive. So, um, but, uh, okay, so I have, because you brought up the, um, uh, the do androids dream of electric sheep, Mercedes, I was thinking about, especially with respect to your presentation, Nora, um, this question of terminology, this sort of terminological um, deadlock where we just don't feel like the metaphors or the literal references really have any linear relationship to one another. And it made me think of a wonderful book by Sao Young Chu, um, Do Metaphors Dream of Literal Sleep, in which she reverses a classical notion about science fiction, namely that science fiction alienates us from our world in order to help us critique it. And she says, no, actually, science fiction is a literal discourse now 
about a metaphysically alienated world in which we live. And it strikes me that, I mean, within the field of science fiction studies, this made a big splash a few years ago, but it strikes me that the, that the, this entails that, you know, the literal language that we use about the everyday world is in a sense metaphorical or is in a sense sort of ungrounded in the way that we would wish it to be grounded. And that what you're pointing to there, Nora, is that, is that the, is that deep learning systems or artificial intelligence systems, and this is what gives the art that's associated with them its urgency now, is uh, uh, basically occupy this, this distance between a metaphor and a literal referent that we can't make sense of, or we don't know how to draw the line. So we feel we're on that itinerary somehow, but we don't know where we are or where the itinerary is going exactly. And I was just thinking that if we frame it that way, that then, then, then a lot of the different pieces of that come together, like the problem of human versus machine that you talked about, Joanna, this suddenly becomes a problem of precisely a metaphor that is just failing to do the work that it should be doing or did do for a lot of the 20th century in media studies, right? Or, you know, you have then, uh, you know, problems of antagonism and bias, and those problems should then properly be in that Lacanian register, as you mentioned, Murad, because it's a question of the real and not a question of a literal reference or a reality in a more banal sense, right? So I was just hoping that that would sort of tie things together a little bit in that sense, but I'm just wondering if that is how you see the terminological deadlock that you were talking about, Nora, and whether, whether you see, I mean, do you think that art specifically will help us out of that, or do we need a critical discourse as a supplement or just, you know, whether you have any thoughts in that arena. Sure, I can, I can try and answer some parts of that. Excellent, excellent question. I will probably need more time in the future and we'll respond further in writing. Um, I, I think Joanna and, and Mercedes, you made a really great point. Um, and just what it brought up for me is that museums also and art spaces also offer a pedagogical space where you can have conversations that um, I find that I can't have necessarily in academia, I can't have necessarily with engineers, but I can have in a space where all of us co-create language that maybe, you know, captures these concepts a little bit better. So I think as a critic, um, you know, really close reading the language that we use about artificial intelligence, like every single word dug down into becomes extremely destabilized. So intelligence, we use intelligence when we mean a deep learning system trained by crude artificial neurons. We use seeing for advanced pattern recognition that you know can barely tell between a tree in motion and a face in motion. We use predictive, which predict it, you can predict and statistically model what might happen. But when you're talking about predictive policing, you're talking about something more akin to scrying or looking into a crystal ball of why a person might do a criminal act in the future based on something they did five years ago. So none of the words match what's actually happening. <laughs> and so, you know, it is, it's essential to find space in which we can debate what a better language might be. And I'm, I'm not sure if this is like, you know, a, a concrete answer, but I do find that language is co-created across the humanities and the sciences uh, to find some other kind of language in between. And I don't think it's going to come just from art criticism and or from engineering. And it will come between some co-created language between the fields. I Thank you. I totally agree with that. Thank you. Um, I can maybe weave something in that Lauren Stone asked in the chat um, and a part of a question. And that was about the pervasive rhetoric of and pedagogy of scene and make like training the machine which image sets. Um, any comments on that uh, kind of language that we're using off the top of your head? So what kind of ontological category, she asked, does this create if we speak about this? I mean, it naturally also leads to all these uh, comparisons with a machine as a child that learns to see and to write and to identify and so on. 
Can I maybe say something briefly on this? And I'll be kind of riffing on, on what Nora's just said, but also on Murat's piece and the reader on the kind of the idea of, of what we mean when we say certain things. And I'm particularly interested in perception here and the idea of how we could hack perception, uh, both as a uh, as, as a set of mechanisms, algorithms, if you like, but also as a concept, so more than just a word, it's a concept that does a lot of things for us. And I'm just rereading uh, Jonathan Crary's uh, Suspension of Perception book, which analyzes the redefinition of perception in the kind of late 19th century and its reconfiguration alongside capital uh, as a form of attention. And it's very interesting to think about what kinds of concept of perception uh, and a kind of concept of vision gets implicated in the idea of machine vision that relates to these kind of data sets and that pattern recognition and what kind of is this really a form of human vision is it like seeing like a child or is it some kind of truncated immobile entity that doesn't kind of move in the world that only sees in 2d and then if 3D things emerge, they emerge very differently than for a mobile body that is in the world and off the world. So that kind of idea of, uh, of, of work that hacks perception opens it up, a kind of checks against its very kind of foundational concepts, I think is something that is of interest to me around some of that. And then if we are, so that builds on what we are talking about you know training through all these data sets or image sets you know who is doing the seeing is it even a seeing you know what is happening behind that and could we could we teach machines to see better but could we playing with those uh narratives discourses and technologies of of machine vision say could we ourselves learn to see better is there a time for another suspension of perception in the age of ai Mm -hmm. I'm going to synthesize some of the remarks that have come in the Q&A. So uh, Jeremy Pilcher remarked that it's really valuable to hear references to the links backwards to previous artistic and philosophical issues. And, and, and uh, Nirit Ben Mir then uh, made the comment that um, how would you describe the production of artists when they work with art? And um, it's quite an interesting link um, that's been brought up. So it reminds me of the art of garden and landscape design because uh, an artist creates an infrastructure and then loses control of it. That's how it has been described. Um, any one of you, Murad, maybe you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a great comparison, I think, and I haven't something I haven't thought of before. But you know, some people tend to think of it in terms of, I guess, you know, like Soluit's kind of instructional pieces. Um, it's not, and it's not that per se. It's not even as strict as a set of instructions. Perhaps it is. It is about this experimental co-creation that can kind of just run away. And in terms of that, I'm thinking of the work of Terence Broad. Um, I think as well as it's a PhD student at Goldsmiths, but also, you know, he works with generative networks. But something he's doing, which is quite interesting, is refusing, I guess, to follow through the logical instructions of what GAN artworks mean, right? So typically you have a generator making fake samples and a discriminator um, who is discriminating against them, saying, oh, you know, are these fake, are these real? And then as you as it gets better and better, the generator is able to fool the discriminator. But some of Terence Broad's works operate with two generators, essentially synthesizing out of nothing um, and letting them run away with each other's imaginations, you know, and he just provides this kind of experimental base layer, which is, which is just coding the generators um, or he'll situate a generator and optimize it to look for the points at which the discriminator said, oh yes, that's fake, um, or you know, this is, this is obviously incorrect. And he'll exacerbate them and exaggerate them and push those towards a kind of, you know, a runaway aesthetic to the point of abstraction um, and then pull it back to something that's interpretable. So I think there is this, you know, in terms of landscape design, as, you, as um, the question I think said, is there, is there is a sense in which it can run away, but then we have this, as we've discussed, it's this co-creation, which knows when to pull it back and push it forward and, and what the conditions might be to draw that out. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we are coming close to the end because it's already six minutes after seven. Is there any question you want to ask each other or we should pick up leave from the a chat? I'm just reading. <laughs> not, I'm still not uh, multitasking. Like computer have problems, multitasking, I have problems too. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so shall I summarize, try, or of course fail to summarize the discussion and, uh, and um, then say this thanks, unless if anyone jump in and say, I want to really ask that question. Um, all right, I really enjoyed the discussion and it brought out all the um, moments I had hoped for. Um, I think for me, I find it really inspiring uh, to hear how you are all able to shift the discussion um, of AI out of, on one hand, of a, a thing that is, I mean, I think we all agree to a certain extent that it is important to understand and deal with the technical. I think um, uh, the philosopher of this evening, in the beginning at least, which was Gilbert Simondon, is someone who um, uh, yeah, asks for this again and again, and for whom this is quite important, that we study the technical feature of a technical object and artificial intelligence and machine learning are technical objects. But as Nora uh, said, we don't need to, you know, that it's enough to understand the operational logic and to be curious. I think one thing that we need to leave behind us is a little bit of technology to be an instrument that functions, but be more curious about its role and what it can do. And I think um, Joanna also um, expressed and described it beautifully in turning, um, yeah, also the description around to ask how much are we not, not to see artificial intelligence as the other of the human, as something that is threatening our creativity, but that's something that has always been part of creativity and art history, the uh, f uh, faculty where or department where Murat is now based, um, is a very, very big point of um, looking into technical and technicities and materialities and seeing what role they play in the making of art. So I think this is a line that in the future we hope to contribute to bring out more. Um, and yeah, Murat, Thank you very much for opening up uh, the adversarial um, point of view, and I uh, really enjoy how it can, how the back end, I mean, if I and me, we're both trying to understand more and more how the work in the back end um, can help us all to learn more about artificial intelligence, because I think we agree cultural institutions are, and museums are the places and, and contemporary art institutions where we can learn and experiment with AI in a different way and understand the technology from a different perspective that is becoming quite important and quite everywhere in our life where we look. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you all. Uh, I think from an aesthetic point of view, I've also learned uh, quite a bit. Uh, I'll never say any dream metaphor again in the future. <laughs> and um, I still think there are there is uh, in AI art the visual part, and there's a conceptual backend part um, that we need to tend to. Um, and before I thank everyone, Leif, do you want to say a very short something? And Eva. I just want to say thank you so much to you, Mercedes, and to Eva for putting this wonderful event together. I just, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, as you said, uh, uh, and that was, a, I have nothing to add to that summary. It's, it's, it's super wonderful. Just wow. that I think that the type of learning that that we do in these labs is so important for establishing this kind of technical know-how, and the kind of discussion that this is just can't happen if people are isolated by themselves. Uh, even if they're socially distanced and isolated in a technical sense, but or in a physical sense, but uh, and 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 so I'm I'm really happy that this model is is bearing fruit in this way. Yeah, Eva, do you want to say something before I read our long entertaining yeah. list of thanks? I just want to thank you all. Um, I really enjoyed putting the reader together and having the chance to really engage with all of these texts. 
Um, I think most of all, it made me very hopeful, you know, the idea that the human is the center of the universe to me feels very dull and to position it differently and to think about technology differently as you have inspired us all to do tonight, I think can leave us, you know, hopeful uh, for the weekend. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I think a few of you ask in the chat, um, where should we start? We are now interested. We want to read more. How do I find out more? Um, download our reader and read it from <laughs> top to end. Um, thank you, yeah, Eva, very much. I mean, um, Eva and me had a bit the idea from the um, uh, Digital Theory Lab, where we are reading every second week um, with the NYU um, texts. And so we thought uh, a reader with an event would be very nice. And thank you all for contributing a uh, text that Eva beautifully put together. It's a beautiful digital product. And who knows, at some point it might be worth very much. Um, so I say this thanks and then you're all good to go. So I would like to thank very, very much uh, the phenomenal panel members um, and their computers for staying with us, including Murat's camera, who only one time switched off. I'd like to thank Leif's car. Um, and then, of course, the Serpentine Gallery, King's College London, the AHRC, the NYU Digital Theory Lab, London Arts and Humanities Partnership, who provided us with a very excellent uh, PhD student who will write this event up and we can send it out so you all can read up on it. And Eva, who is the best collaborator in the world. So with this, um, we let you go to a hopefully beautiful, nice, calm weekend with not much of computer in front of you. We say goodbye. Good night. Thank you so much.